Thank you so much for joining us this morning. And I just want to say welcome to everyone that is joining us uh, locally and around the world. Those of you who have been a part of this church family for a while and those of you who are brand new, thank you so much for joining us. In September every year, we participate in Recovery Month. Part of the heartbeat of this church is walking together with each other in recovery. And September this year, the theme for Recovery Month is that we are recovering together, that we're better together. But as I was spending time with our recovery minister, Jasmine Turner, and imagining what is the best way to enter into Recovery Month, to prepare our hearts for Recovery Month, we came across several themes, and one of those themes is forgiveness. Today, we're going to have a conversation about forgiveness. That's why I'm seated here at my table, across from your table, taking the time to open God's Word and understand this fearful yet astoundingly powerful concept of forgiveness. The way we're going to begin today is I'm just going to give you some quotes on forgiveness. We're going to put them on the screen, and I'm going to invite you to listen to the quote, read the quote, and contemplate the quote, all on forgiveness. When you hold resentment toward another, you are bound to that person or condition by an emotional link that is stronger than steel. Forgiveness is the only way to dissolve that link and get free. Forgiveness does not change the past, but it does enlarge the future. Before we can forgive one another, we have to understand one another. Leo Tolstoy wrote, which I believe is so apropos for our time, let us forgive each other. Only then will we live in peace. Forgiveness is a sign that the person who has wronged you means more than the wrong they have dealt. Will Smith wrote, Throughout life, people will make you mad, disrespect you, and treat you bad. Let God deal with the things they do, because hate in your heart will consume you too. Forgiveness isn't approving of what has happened. It's choosing to rise above it. Marvin Ashton wrote, Be the one who nurtures and builds. Be the one who has an understanding and a forgiving heart. One who looks for the best in people. Leave people better than you found them. Without forgiveness, life is governed by an endless cycle of resentment and retaliation. Forgiveness, like faith, writes Mason Cooley, you have to keep reviving it. Abraham Lincoln wrote, I have always found that mercy bears richer fruits than strict justice. To forgive is to set a prisoner free and to discover that that prisoner was you. As we think about these quotes on forgiveness, I came across two that impacted me in such a way as what I would kind of suggest is the lights came on to a new idea. David Ridge writes this, true forgiveness is not an action after the fact, it is an attitude 
with which you enter each moment. Let me read that again. True forgiveness is not an action after the fact. It is an attitude with which you enter each moment. I coupled this with a sentiment written by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He wrote, Forgiveness is not an occasional act. It is a constant attitude. Whenever we begin to entertain the idea of forgiveness, we find ourselves struggling, perhaps, a little bit. Because we have experience with forgiveness, this isn't the first time we've contemplated this topic, is it? So sometimes when people hear, well, you know what you need to do is you need to forgive, our mind immediately begins to race to an offense. We begin to think of something intensely personal, perhaps regional, perhaps societal, or even global. We begin to ask questions, at least in our mind, or things like, so what are we supposed to do, forgive Hitler? What are we supposed to do, forgive an abuser? What are we supposed to do? Just, hey, everything's cool with the person in prison who committed such a heinous act. On the other hand, we'll even ask questions like, well, what if the other person doesn't respond? What if the other person doesn't even think they did anything wrong? So the first question is kind of like, does forgiveness condone sin? And the second question is, are there limits to the impact of forgiveness? Is forgiveness, reconciliation. So it is important that we define forgiveness. The primary word for forgiveness in the New Testament uh, comes out of the meaning of the original language of the New Testament, which was Greek. And that word, uh, it's a word that can mean something like removing your clothing. It's a word that can mean putting something away from you. So forgiveness is actually, a good way to say it would be something like some of these quotes hinted at, that it is the setting free of something, the letting go of something. Now, first of all, we have to acknowledge that forgiveness is not the condoning of sin, not the condoning of wrong. In fact, The fact that forgiveness is invoked means that the wrong is being acknowledged at least by someone, perhaps by God, perhaps by the person who was wronged, or, as in the best case scenario, even being acknowledged by the person who committed the wrong. So forgiveness is not a condoning of what is wrong. But we also have to acknowledge that forgiveness does not always extend to blessing the person who committed the wrong. Because sometimes people do not believe they have committed a wrong, nor are they willing to admit that they have committed a wrong. Forgiveness isn't reconciliation, but forgiveness can open the door for reconciliation. So forgiveness in and of itself, begins within a person or begins with God with the decision that a wrong that has been committed requires a response and that that response includes forgiveness. But how would we approach this concept in the last two quotes I gave of what I'm going to name in this message, advance forgiveness. That we begin to prepare our hearts and minds in life for advance forgiveness as a default of life that our spiritual condition is a condition characterized by forgiveness. So in preparation for this lesson, as I was talking through it with my wife, Susan, I asked my wife this question. When did Jesus prepare to forgive his killers? You do know that one of the most famous passages in the New Testament on forgiveness 
is in Luke chapter 23, when Jesus is on the cross, the Bible reads this way. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, ha, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar. They said, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. So I want you to notice something from the cross. Jesus offered forgiveness to people who did not believe they were wrong. When Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, they weren't saying, oh, wow, we did the wrong thing. The executioners weren't sitting there wringing their hands thinking, we shouldn't have killed this guy. Notice that the leaders even mocked him. They sneered at him. Oh, I want to slow down for a moment and mention, I'm not saying that no one at Calvary had questions about what was happening. I am so confident that Jesus' mother, her closest friends, and perhaps some unnamed people in the crowd, wept, shook their heads in astounding grief, and thought, no, you're killing an innocent man. But you see, they were not in need of forgiveness of this sort. So when Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, he wasn't saying that to his mother or her friends or those who believed he was innocent. He was saying that to his killers. But his killers didn't believe they had done anything wrong. Well, when did Jesus decide that he would forgive his killers. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8, the Bible says that Jesus is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Peter echoes this in his first letter, where he too says that Jesus was sacrificed or gave his life for the sins of the world before the foundation of the world. This is echoed in Ephesians chapter 1. Jesus, in his prayer before his arrest, according to John 17, says, Father, restore to me the glory that I had with you before the creation of the world. So the eternal Son of God was prepared to forgive his killers before the world was created. Jesus truly was ready to forgive in advance. You see, for me, and maybe for you, I often entertain forgiveness after the offense. After something has happened, I start trying to figure out, how will I forgive them? Some of those things happened in my childhood where I can look back on my childhood and think, have I ever forgiven that person? How will I forgive that person? Some of the things are as current as yesterday. How will I forgive that person? I need to forgive that person. I'm entertaining forgiveness after the offense. I believe that's normal. Does it seem normal to you that after someone does something to us, we would try to figure out how to forgive? You see, the orientation of this message about forgiveness is not you or me seeking to be forgiven by someone else. That is another message on forgiveness. That is another place that we must go to understand the role and the benefit of forgiveness. But this message is focused on one orientation of forgiveness. How do we forgive? How do we forgive ourselves? And how do we forgive others? 
And what Jesus is modeling for us is forgiveness for the follower of Christ is more than an after-the-fact assessment of the situation and then seeking to figure out how to forgive what has happened. What Jesus models for us is the preparation in advance that we would forgive. So I thought about it this way. How would we go about that? Would we not have to do what we've been doing this morning? Define forgiveness. Define that forgiveness is not the condoning of wrong, nor does it automatically mean the reconciliation of a relationship. That forgiveness is the letting go of something. It is the being set free of something that allows us to dissolve the bond that keeps us in bondage to the wrong that was done. Would we not have to entertain how Jesus went about forgiving? Would we not have to actually kind of confront a simpler question? And that would be, um, do we believe Jesus is right about forgiveness? Because think about this. Jesus calls us to forgive, not just by his teachings, but by his own example. Jesus commands us to forgive. It's not an option. But number three, Jesus says there's a consequence if you don't forgive. So the call, the command, and the consequence all set us up to have to ask, do we believe Jesus is right about this? When Jesus says, if you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. Do we believe that? When Jesus tells us that through him all things are possible and that there's nothing that's happened that can't be forgiven, that in forgiveness, though we do not condone what was done that was wrong, nor do we imagine that every relationship will be healed just because we offer forgiveness, we understand that forgiveness itself is not an option and we need it. We need it not just for the potential benefit to someone else, we need forgiveness in order to be right with God and right with ourselves. You see, for, for me, sometimes I've felt like Jesus' teachings on forgiveness were too hard, too harsh, out of reach. So I wondered about this. What if we could imagine a curriculum on forgiveness. Maybe we would title a class The Christian Imagination of Forgiveness. And maybe, maybe we would offer this class as a, as a like in college, a 101, a 201, a 301, and a 401, right? That we would design a curriculum around forgiveness. And maybe part of the prerequisite would be let's imagine a world without forgiveness. A world where there is no forgiveness. That the only way to address a wrong is retaliation and revenge. That either you retaliate, meaning that you take an action that is like the action that was done. That you either threw permanent neglecting that person and no longer having any responsibility to that person's life at all, so the retaliation by neglect or retaliation by hitting them back in the exact same way they hit you that will just retaliate. Or revenge, which means not only am I going to retaliate, but I actually perhaps want to inflict greater pain than the original offense. Could we imagine a world without forgiveness? That might motivate us to say we really need forgiveness in our world. And we need to understand how to approach it. So if we approached forgiveness as a core study class, a requirement to graduate in life, it's not an elective or a minor that we can choose or not choose. 
it would have to be something that we say, this is a requirement. So, since we're back in school, and we've got a lot of teachers that are, are uh, uh, studying along with us this morning, what about this? Preschool teachers, what would you do to add to your required curriculum training students in forgiveness? Elementary school teachers, what would the modules look like? What would the measurements look like? What would the activities of engagement look like if your students were required to meet a minimum standard of competency and understanding in forgiveness? Middle school teachers, what modules would be added to help middle school students navigate forgiveness? High school teachers, you can see where we're going. And what about university and graduate school classes that all required a certain level of competency in regard to forgiveness? What would we say, well, this has to be a part of the class? This kind of teaching, this kind of engagement, this kind of understanding, and how would you measure it? Not just from the head, but from the heart and from action. How would we develop a level of commitment, capacity, competency, and creativity around forgiveness? So then my mind expanded further. I thought about, well, what if we required training and forgiveness in all premarital counseling? Well, what if that was one of the required modules in order to get married was you had to show competency in forgiveness? I thought about, what about preacher training? I can promise you right now, I was unprepared for the level of forgiveness that would be required in my role of myself and others, and I should have had a class to better train me on that. What about coaches, teachers? People that serve in the criminal justice system. People that med serve in the medical uh, 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 profession. What about people who are helping others in self-development? Should there not be competency in regard to forgiveness if it is so essential to our mental and emotional health and our relational success? The final question I would ask about developing these courses in all levels of life and phases of life would be, how would we embed the Christian imagination of forgiveness in our daily life so that we are literally, like Jesus, preparing in advance to forgive those who sin against us? Would it not change our world? And would it not, could it not change us? I wonder, how would we think about this COVID experience? All the turmoil in our world. How would our conversations about it change? Wearing masks, not wearing masks. When to go back to school and work and not go back to school and work. When to reunite and meeting on campus as a church. When to not unite, reunite and meeting on campus on a church. How would it change our conversations if we went into every conversation prepared to forgive? How would it change the conversation in our nation around racism, classism, sexism? How would it change the conversation around the angst, the hurt, the grief that people are feeling, whether it be in Wisconsin, Minneapolis, Atlanta, anywhere in our nation? How would it change those conversations if we prepared in advance before the conversation to carry in a spirit of forgiveness? How will it change the next 90 days as we approach a national election fraught with division? How could we be a part of the healing of our nation and the healing and the oneness of our communities and our churches if we prepared in advance to forgive. Jesus, before he was arrested, went into a garden to pray. In that garden, he prayed for oneness and unity, the oneness of the world and the unity 
of the people of God. And then he went to the cross and not one statement on the cross, not one step toward the cross. At any point did Jesus sow division or disunity. Not one step, not one statement. Every single one of them showed the humanity of the moment, the pain of the moment, the hurt of the moment, while modeling forgiveness. Of the six statements and one question on the cross, the second to the last was, it is finished. The first was, Father, forgive them. I don't think that the disciples missed the impact of Jesus' advanced forgiveness. Because you see in Acts chapter 2, when the very people that had killed Jesus finally understood the impact of their actions, when Peter said, let all the house of Israel know for certain that this Jesus, whom you killed, is both Lord and Christ. The people, with the scales falling off their eyes and feeling stabbed in the heart, cried out, what do we do? Peter didn't say, that's too late. You should have got it when it happened. You should have figured it out 40 days ago. Peter doesn't say that. Peter was ready with the message Jesus gave him in advance. He says to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Ready for the forgiveness of your sins? Do you remember that? Well, that's Acts chapter, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. But do you remember verse 39? And this promise is for you and for your children and for all who are afar off, for as many as the Lord our God will call. What does that say? Just as the disciples saw Jesus prepare in advance to forgive the killers, then Peter gave us an advance promise of forgiveness for every generation that would follow. We are living as the people who have received the advance forgiveness of God. And now we're called to be the people who offer the advance forgiveness of God. You may be feeling today, I need that forgiveness. I need it. Can I receive that forgiveness? As the answer is yes, you are included in that promise. Right now, you'll notice if you're watching this live in the chat box, there's a place for you to click on a button to take next steps. You can click on it right now. You can also reach out to an elder or a minister right now. You can reach out to someone that you're watching this with right now and begin to experience the freedom of forgiveness. The advanced promise of forgiveness is for you. But you can also start to offer it right now. The promise that we can be free to set others free.